there. You're watching Debrief on CNN News 18. I'm Maha Siddiqui. Only yesterday, we seemed to believe that the Ukraine crisis is turning a corner as Russian troops were heading back to their bases. But this was contested by the West, especially the US, with the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying that this was no meaningful pullback by Russia. Now, the NATO defense ministers have also come out with a statement saying that they are gravely worried about the situation as it is developing because of the unprovoked buildup of the Russian forces on the Ukrainian border and that Russia should seriously looking at the path of diplomacy. But amidst all this, there is another critical issue that all the players in this uh, situation at the moment are looking at and that is how energy, that is fuel and gas, can be used as a geopolitical weapon. And here the, the crucial issue of Nord Stream 2 comes into play. This is a gas pipeline that goes directly from Russia to Germany. It will be very effective for Germany, but it bypasses Ukraine. Ukraine wants security guarantees and US believes that this could be used as a leverage, that is Nord Stream 2 could be used as a leverage by Russia and could help it influence Europe as well. This is what we'll be talking about in debrief today. But before that, let's take a look at the India angle. There are about 20,000 Indian citizens in Ukraine. They have been worried about the uncertainty on the ground and wanting to come back to the country. India issued an advisory only recommending those who do not have any essential work in Ukraine to come back temporarily. But there was another problem. Flight prices had gone up four times. Flights were all booked as well. Now the government says that it has done away with the air bubble for Ukraine for the moment so that more flights can reach and especially students, Indian students studying in Ukraine who wish to come back temporarily can take those flights. Ridhima Bhatnagar has the details. With the threat of war still looming large over Ukraine, the Indian government has been keeping a close eye on developments to ensure safety of Indians. Ukraine has an estimated 20,000 Indians, with most of them being students. The majority of them study in medical colleges in Ukraine, which has been a popular destination for the last couple of decades. On Tuesday, the Indian government had issued an advisory saying, and I'd like to quote, in view of uncertainties of the current situation in Ukraine, Indian nationals in Ukraine, particularly students, whose stay is not essential, may consider leaving temporarily." End quote. The advisory had come in the backdrop of Dutch national flag carrier KLM, halting all flights to Kyiv, saying it won't operate in the Ukrainian airspace. It was the first major carrier to announce a halt in the service, leading to panic on the ground. An advisory was also issued by the Indian Embassy in Kyiv, which advised Indian nationals to avoid all non-essential travel to and within Ukraine. But with India still operating with air bubbles and flight fares increasing, Indian students wanted a government intervention. Look, these flights we can't do it ourselves at this time. It's very expensive. One lakh, one lakh, two lakh, two lakh, two lakh tickets have been bought. And some some flights are not board bhi nahi rahi, thik se. और बहुत सारी फ्लाइट्स कैंसिल हो चुकी है तो मेरा अनुरोध है भारत सरकार से कि आप प्लीज हमारी मदद करिए इन व्हाट विल बी अ बिग रिलीफ फॉर स्टूडेंट्स टुडे द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ सिविल एविएशन रिमूव्ड द रिस्ट्रिक्शन ऑन नंबर ऑफ फ्लाइट्स इन सीट्स बिटवीन इंडिया एंड यूक्रेन एसेंशियली डूइंग अवे विद द एयर बबल अरेंजमेंट सो नाउ एनी नंबर ऑफ फ्लाइट्स एज़ वेल एज़ चार्टर फ्लाइट्स कैन ऑपरेट बिटवीन बोथ द कंट्रीज as per the ministry indian airlines have been informed to increase flights to cater to the increase in demand the ministry of external affairs or the mea on wednesday had already set up a control room to provide information and assistance to indian nationals in addition the indian embassy in ukraine had also set up a 24 hour helpline for indians in the eastern european nation as you know the situation on the ground currently from what we hear is not uh, where they are uh, keen to move immediately, but there are concerns, obviously, with the developments. But I don't think uh, it's, it's, a, it's an evacuation. Till now, more than a dozen countries have urged their citizens to leave Ukraine. The United States, the UK and Germany are among those who've told their nationals to leave. 
Many countries, including Australia, Italy, Israel, the Netherlands and Japan, have also issued similar advisories. Some have also evacuated diplomatic staff and their families. Even as Russia is claiming of a pullback on the ground, experts say it may be too early to say that war clouds have moved away. Pridhima Bhatnagar for CNN News 18. Videos from the Russian military show the troop movement back to their bases. This Moscow is using to show that there is a pullback. However, NATO Secretary General and also the US seem to believe that there is a rising buildup on the Ukrainian border on the east. Jim Sweeto of CNN has the report. A very public display. Russia's Ministry of Defense posting video of armor leaving Crimea across the Kerch Strait and it says returning to their home bases. Their participation in exercise said to be over. A few hours later, another convoy of fuel trucks filmed getting ready to leave Crimea as well, and then filmed on that same bridge, also heading east. All part of a choreographed effort by the Kremlin in the ongoing information war over its intentions in Ukraine. Russian diplomats across Europe scoff at Western claims that an attack is imminent. But both U.S. officials and NATO officials, including the Secretary General, say, in fact, Russian troop numbers are continuing to rise. So uh, just that we see movement of forces, so battle tanks doesn't uh, uh, confirm a real withdrawal. Um, uh, it has been a bit up and down, back and forth all the way. But the trend of the last uh, weeks and months has been a steady increase in the Russian uh, capabilities uh, close to Ukraine's uh, borders. This is one of the videos issued Tuesday by Russia's defense ministry on units beginning, it claims, to go home. Followed up on Wednesday with more footage of the tanks loading onto trains, destination unknown. Back in Crimea, the much advertised pullout involves units whose bases are, in any case, around Russian cities still close to Ukraine. Analysts say it will take at least several days to establish whether there is a true drawdown of Russian forces from positions around Ukraine. For now, the picture remains mixed. There is plenty of Russian armor and air power still within just a few miles of the Ukrainian border. This according to social media videos uploaded in the past day. Satellite images from earlier this week show fighter bombers and helicopters arriving at air bases close to Ukraine. The joint exercises in Belarus continue as well. Though the Belarus defense minister insists every piece of Russian equipment will leave when those exercises are over. All the while, a very public war of words continues over Ukraine's aspirations to join NATO, over the fate of the breakaway eastern regions of Ukraine, and over Russia's demands for cast iron security guarantees. President Putin and Russian officials repeat that Ukraine's desire to join NATO must be off the table. That, however, is a non-starter for the U.S. So far, the path to diplomacy and much of the weaponry seem frozen in place. The U.S. is now closely watching the Donbas region in eastern Ukraine. The Russian president claimed crimes against ethnic Russians there, as the Russian parliament has now given the president the power, at least, to recognize the Donbas area as independent. The U.S. concern is that Russia might use that as a pretext to further invade eastern Ukraine. And CNN's Connor Powell is now joining us with the very latest from Lviv in Ukraine. Uh, Connor, first of all, the claim by Russia that there is a troop pullback is being disputed. Uh, the U.S. Secretary of State saying that this is no meaningful pullback. What is the Ukrainian side saying? Is this pullback happening? And if so, from where? Yeah, so far we haven't seen any meaningful pullback of Russian troops. That's according to both the United States and also to other NATO commanders who have said that, if anything, Russia has added to their force along the Ukrainian border that a couple of days ago was estimated at about 150,000 or so Russian troops along that Ukrainian border. Now, here in Ukraine, the Ukrainian leaders have said that they're watching this. They've seen this Russian force build up over the last couple of weeks. Uh, they still say that regardless of the troop size, the amount of uh, troops that are along that border, they don't think that this is a Russian invasion. They think this is a Russian sort of threat. 
and they don't see this as a possible invasion any time in the near future, but they certainly are concerned and they they mimic the same thing that we're hearing out of Washington and other NATO countries is that they want to see a reduction of Russian troops along the border. But right now, even though the Kremlin has said that they will begin repositioning Russian troops along that border, pulling some back, that just isn't happening. There is still this massive Russian force along that border. Hmm. Connor, has there been any statement with regards to movement of Russian troops from Belarus once the joint exercises are over? Well, so the Russian um, government has been saying that this is just all a military training exercise and that it's Western hysteria that has led to this confrontation and this crisis. Uh, there are tens of thousands of Russian troops in neighboring Belarus along the Belarusian and Ukrainian border. This is all supposed to wrap up if it is in fact a training exercise in the next couple of days. And many of those, if not all of those Russian troops that are in neighboring Belarus are supposed to go home. Um, but right now there's no indication that's happening and the Belarusians aren't really saying anything along the lines of what's expected to happen. The messaging is very much coming out of the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin and the foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. So. Hmm. At this point, we just don't know what's going to happen with those Russian troops in the neighboring country of Belarus. And, and that's kind of what we're watching. The United hmm. States and NATO have said that for any talks to go forward, they want to see a massive reduction of Russian troops from the border area. Until that happens, uh, there is still this possibility of an imminent invasion, according to NATO and other countries uh, in the NATO alliance. Hmm. So. Right now, what's happening there, it just isn't clear until we see some type of large scale withdrawal from the border. And that just isn't happening right now. Connor, amidst all this, what is the message that Ukraine has given Germany on Nord Stream 2, which it believes can be a geopolitical weapon? Yeah, this is an argument that's been going on for several years now, which is that uh, NATO, the U.S., um, and Ukraine do not want to see the completion of this pipeline, this uh, oil and gas pipeline going from Russia uh, into neighboring Germany, uh, in large part because in the past, Russia has cut off gas supplies through Ukraine uh, that caused um, a, a lot of co uh, concern and problems for the power industry in, uh, in 2006 in Europe. And, and Ukraine sees this pipeline not only diverting a uh, key gas infrastructure that goes through its own country from Russia into Europe. But also they're well aware that if this pipeline is implemented and goes into Germany, uh, Germany is essentially at the hands and the will of the Russian government in the future and could be cut off. So Ukraine sees it uh, pretty much the way that the United States sees it, which is that Nord Stream 2 is very, very dangerous to the continuation of power uh, and, and gas supplies to Europe, and they would like to see this project canceled. Uh, that said, Germany has pushed ahead with this. It does face some hurdles in uh, the German legal system, and Germany is under a lot of pressure from the United States and other NATO allies not to go through with this, but this is very much at the heart of this entire confrontation here, which is the development of this power or the, this gas line. Uh, but right now, it's scheduled to go forward as long as Russia doesn't invade Ukraine. That seems to be the only thing at this moment that would prevent uh, Germany from canceling this project. Connor May, thanks for joining us with all those details from Ukraine. And as Connor was explaining over there, Nord Stream 2, this also seems to be at the heart of the conflict at the moment. After all, Germany will get cheap gas, which can actually heat up about 26 million German homes. So for them, the Nord Stream 2 is very significant. But Ukraine has its own issues which it has raised about uh, the transit not being through Ukraine, that this Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, which is an underwater 770 miles long pipeline from Russia to Germany, can be used as a geopolitical weapon. And that is why, if you were wondering why Germany is playing a critical role at the moment uh, and the German Chancellor acting as a mediator, this could be that answer. That is the reason that uh, uh, that Olaf Scholz is playing that critical role currently. Take a look at what Nord Stream 2 is and what the entire controversy is about.
Close at the heart of the Ukraine crisis is another critical issue, Nord Stream 2. The undersea 770-mile gas pipeline from Russia to Germany that bypasses Ukraine. It not only boosts Russian gas sales to Europe, but also underscores the strategic leverage and victory for Russia. Ukraine is really the prize, both for the Europeans and for the Russians. And so the gas issue will undoubtedly shift that balance back towards Moscow. So President Biden's stake is part commercial. The US would like to sell its shale gas to Europe, but mostly strategic. Biden has made clear that Nord Stream 2 is a bad deal. It's a bad deal because it divides Europe. It exposes Ukraine and Central Europe to Russia and manip Russian manipulation. Former German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who was the key to the success of a strong US-Europe relationship, had opposed any possible US sanctions on Nord Stream 2. Germany has a very strong reason for it. The pipeline could heat 26 million German homes at an affordable price and construction was completed for the pipeline in September. This is an area in which Germany is really alone. Uh, its European neighbours are against it, the EU is against it and the US is against it. In the recent meeting between Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, Zelensky said that they discussed the security risks associated with Nord Stream 2 and there were some differences in the assessment. He said Ukraine views it as a geopolitical weapon, which is why it needs energy security guarantees. Meanwhile, German regulators are yet to issue the final legal permission to Russian state-owned Gazprom for the operationalization of Nord Stream 2. US believes that Nord Stream 2 can be used by Russia as a leverage to increase its sphere of influence in Europe. With inputs from CNN, Bureau Report, CNN News 18. Strategic affairs expert Brahma Chalani is now joining us here on the show. Many thanks, sir, for speaking with CNN News 18. Is this conflict in Ukraine also very much about energy then and Nord Stream 2 being at the heart of it, Brahma Chalani? Well, energy is very much at the center of the current crisis. There's no doubt about that. But more importantly, the current crisis has the makings of a drawn-out and dangerous confrontation between Russia and the U.S., with Ukraine serving as a pawn for both sides in this geopolitical confrontation. In fact, the real issue is not Ukraine, but it's NATO's forward policy. Russia has mounted major military buildup against Ukraine to compel the U.S. to abandon its uh, policy of NATO creep to Russia's borders. Russia believes that the U.S. is working to turn Ukraine into a militarized frontline force of Russia, just the way the U.S. armed Pakistan from the 1950s onwards and created a frontline force against India. So put it bluntly, Russia doesn't want a Pakistan on its southwestern borders, but coming to energy. That issue is important for Russia because Russia has become, has become a, a, ma a major exporter of energy. And it's also very important for Europe. European countries rely on Russian energy. But the Americans, you know, look at, look at what the U.S. objective is and why they are objecting to North Stream 2. Washington's aim is to supplant Russian energy supplies with U.S. energy supplies. That's what they're seeking to do. They want Europe to turn to U.S. oil and gas supplies. But that's easier said than done, because the Russian supplies are coming through pipeline. There's a, there's a particular infrastructure that's already in place. The American supplies are going to come by ship. And creating the alternative infrastructure will take years and will, and will cost billions and billions of dollars. So it's not as simple that, let's say, Germany, instead of buying gas from Russia via pipeline, starts relying on, on American shipments of gas. 
But there's a bigger issue. Yeah, which is the did, weaponization. Does this Nord Stream 2 then have the potential to, uh, you know, uh, draw a wedge within Europe and between Germany and US as well? Definitely. It's already, it's already creating a divide between countries like France and Germany on one side. These are two of the biggest powers of Europe. And the US on the other side. We're talking about, you know, the the, the, the pretense is that there is unity in the Western camp. No, there's actually a, quite a clear divide. Both Germany and France are taking a more moderate stance on the Russia-Ukraine issue. In fact, the drumbeats of war are being sounded not by Ukraine, but by Washington. And that's the, that's the irony in, in this entire situation, that the country that, that is at the center of this crisis, Ukraine, is urging Washington not to overplay the Russian threat. That plea has been made by the Ukrainian president repeatedly. But coming to the energy issue which you raised, there are two ways to weaponize energy supplies. One is through unilateral sanctions to deny a producer access to markets as in the case of the Nord Stream okay. 2, or the prevailing U.S. sanctions against Iran and Venezuela. Another way is to weaponize okay. energy is for a producer to deliberately hold back supplies, as Russia is threatening to do. As the threat from Russia continues and the hysteria generated by the other side, Ukraine is trying to put up a brave face. They observed the Unity Day on the 16th of February, leaving you with these visuals. The chorus of Kharkiv Opera House singing in defiance of this. Russia massing what the US says are 150,000 troops on three sides of Ukraine's border. In Kharkiv, 25 miles from the frontier, a day of national unity is quickly marked. In case Russia does send tanks into this vast landscape, Ukrainians insist that they recall the words of their national anthem. Our enemies will die as the dew does in the sunshine, and we brothers will live happily in our land. <laughs>